Good afternoon. My name is Mark DePew. I'm the Director of Oral History at the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library. Today is Tuesday, February 16, 2010, and I'm back for a fourth session with Mary Lee Leahy. Good afternoon, Mary Lee. Good afternoon, Mark. We should probably start this by explaining a little bit of something. Um, our last interview was quite some time ago, probably well over a year ago, and uh, we talked about variety of things in those three sessions. Uh, the Constitutional Convention back in 1970 and your role in that. Uh, some landmark Supreme Court legislation you were involved with. Uh, one of those being the Rutan decision, the other one Pickering. That's right. Um, and your role in some other legislation, or uh, specifically your role in the Walker administration and your affiliation with Dan Walker. But we got up to a point in time, and we kind of ended the interview, and I think of a high note, certainly, but we didn't talk about the last two gubernatorial administrations, uh, those being George Ryan and Rod Blagojevich. And uh, there were a variety of reasons why we didn't talk about it at the time, but this seemed to be the appropriate time to pick that up and to talk about a significant role you had in the beginning of the Blagojevich administration. So why don't you tell just very briefly what that was, and then I'll, we'll get to the questions. Well, after uh, Rod Blagojevich was elected governor, he put together a transition team, which dealt with a variety of issues. There were subcommittees, ethics, personnel, revenue, broad variety of issues. And then I believe it was the Saturday before the inauguration that I received a phone call asking me, it was a, an aide of the governor to be, asking me to serve for three months advising the administration on personnel issues. And so I talked to my daughters and then on Sunday I called back and said that I would do it. So um, I believe the inauguration was Tuesday and uh, we then, I started my work for three months. It turned out to be longer but I began. As these sometimes happen to do. Yes. Uh, why you and personnel issues? Well. I had sued the state so many times that I really thought I knew how the personnel system worked. And I found in this transition team that when I would be talking about the personnel system in Illinois, it was extremely complicated. And I think the transition team learned from me and realized that I might have some insight into how it was working after the governor took office. Okay, and we're going to spend a little bit of time just a few minutes having you explain some of the intricacies of that personnel system, hopefully in a way that a layman like myself can even understand it, <laughs> if that's possible. Um, you were serving on the advisory board and not the transition team itself? That's right. Now, what was the difference in the two? Because the advisory team got <coughs> recommendations from these committees on certain issues and uh, reviewed them and that type of thing. I mean, it was tremendously active. I mean, we had meetings and there were lots of people involved, Don Clark Nett, Chab Mikva. I mean, he really put together a, mm -hmm. a really outstanding transition team and advisory board. The problem was that once the inauguration took place, it seemed to me all of that disappeared. Mm -hmm. Who else served on the advisory board with you? Who chaired the board? Well, the board was co-chaired. I believe that uh, Governor Thompson was one of the co-chairs. He conducted several of the general meetings, and they were held in Chicago. So here you have a brand new Democrat, the first one in how many years, 20 years perhaps, something like the 22 years maybe, and he chooses to, to chair his advisory board, the former Republican governor of the state. That's right. Uh, and I think that was a tone of reaching out to both sides of the aisle, which um, I believe also fast disappeared. Mm -hmm. Well, a couple of others that I had uh, written down here, Roland Burris. Yes. The name in the news here recently. Luz Gutierrez. Yes. And uh, Margaret Blackshear. Yes, Margaret Blackshear was the first, I hope I've got that right, the first woman to head the AFL-CIO in Illinois. She had been head of the Illinois Federation of Teachers which is part of the AFL-CIO, and then moved into the presidency. And I have you down as the vice chair of this advisory mm -hmm. board. Yes. Okay. Was that more than just a, uh, a figurehead position? Well, it just meant attendance at the meetings and contributing what I could. No, I don't think it had any particular duties. It was more or less the title. Okay. Tell us a little bit about the transition team itself then. 
Well, as I said, we were discussing all sorts of issues, tremendous variety mm -hmm. of issues, hoping then to turn it into legislation or executive orders so that the new administration, the Blagojevich administration, would appear to be moving, to be changing things and um, reforming things. Mm -hmm. I know ethics was a big topic, as you can imagine. And who did he have working on the ethics piece? Well, I specifically remember Ab McFund, Don Clark Netch contributing a lot. And then the subcommittees had a staff member mm -hmm. or two to assist them in drafting different proposals, making changes, circulating the proposals for comments, that type of thing. Now, I know that the, uh, the transition team itself was headed by David Wilhelm. What can you tell us about David? He was very active in the campaign. He'd had a long history of being active in campaigns. And he, w he even had a national uh, prominence, did he not? Yes, that's correct. Okay. Any other names that stick with you that were involved with the transition team? There were several lawyers from prominent <coughs> law firms in Chicago, including Winston and Strawn, Governor Thompson's law firm. Mm -hmm. And uh, many of those lawyers had had experience on personnel issues. So we had a lot of give and take on that. Okay. Um, what were the specific terms of your agreement with the Blagojevich administration? First of all, did you have a contract? Well, that was one of the issues. Um, I kept asking for my contract. And finally, in mid-February, I stopped working and went up to Chicago and met with Susan Lichtenstein, who was the uh, governor's chief legal counsel. And I said, look, under the laws of the state of Illinois, I've got to have a contract. And um, I think there was a bit of difficulty with the chief legal counsel and the other counsel in that they came out of corporate America, mm -hmm. corporate Illinois, and so, you know, you sort of just snapped your fingers and things <laughs> happened, and so the personnel code and the procurement code and all these various codes that governed Illinois business were difficult because I think some of them viewed it as hampering being able to do things. But I said, look, I've just got to have a contract. So then when I got the contract, it did not retain me as an attorney. In fact, that was explicitly crossed out as legal consultant, the word legal was crossed out and initialed it, and I was retained as an attorney on personnel matters. Now, this is a standard contract. That was one of my recommendations, that if you're going to hire individuals, this contract be redone, because the contract read as if I were General Motors. I had to agree to abide by OSHA. I had to agree <laughs> to abide by the Clean Air Act. I had to agree to buy by all sorts of things as though I were a giant corporation. So I said, Let, let's revise these contracts for individuals. Mm -hmm. What specifically, though, were you supposed to be doing as a part of the transition team as of the advisory board? And was this something that was peculiar or unique to this particular transition, or is it something that all governors would do? Well, no, I think, well, it depends. I do remember that the transition from Governor Ogilvy to Governor Walker was outstanding. I think the potential or future department heads and the current department heads really cooperated. Um, I did not sense that there was that, that there was like the one-on-one -on -one with the Blagojevich and Ryan administration, like the future head of, say, IDOT, cooperating with the current head of IDOT so there would be a smooth transition. I can even remember when I went into EPA, Bill Blazer, who was director of EPA, had a black notebook uh, with different parts, and in there were all the current issues he thought EPA was facing, including proposed legislation, budget, and had alternative questions worked out for me. And we met, we met for a great deal of time, but I did not sense that there was that one-on-one -on -one between the Blagojevich administration and the Ryan administration on who was going to head up the departments. But essentially your position, if I, tell me if I'm, I'm getting this wrong, I'm trying to understand myself. Your position is to kind of oversee and advise the new administration as George Ryan's people move out of government and Rod Blagojevich's team moves into government. Would that be That's in correct. Essence? And it was a very broad charge <clears throat> to advise on personnel matters. But certain things that happened in the fall, which I was specifically told to look into, uh, for example, the statute 
the personnel code allowed for a four-year term appointment. And a four-year term appointment could be filled politically. But once you got the four-year term appointment, you were protected by the personnel code for four years, meaning you could only be fired for cause. Now, my view was that if you can be hired politically, you ought to be able to be fired politically. You should serve at the will of the governor. But this, this hybrid was created. Well, what we learned, we had heard rumors, and then what I learned when I actually began to work in January, was that people who had been appointed by Governor Ryan to a four-year term appointment may have had a year left on it. They left their four-year term in late 2002. They were off the payroll for two or three days, came on with a new four-year term appointment so that they were protected almost to the end of Governor Bogoyevich's first term. So that was something. I mean, was that legal for them to do that? Another thing, and this was during the campaign, Governor Ryan sent over an emergency rule to the Joint Committee on Administrative Rules, mm -hmm. which is made up equal parts of Democrats and Republicans, and they all serve in the legislature. And the emergency rule allowed for persons to be certified under the code after having served a, a one-month probationary period. Originally, everybody had to serve six months, and I think if it were a promotion to a new position, you serve four months probation. If you passed your probationary period successfully, you were then certified and could only be fired for cause. The emergency rule changed that and allowed people who were exempt from Rutan under the Ryan administration to take a position under the personnel code, and if they served 30 days in that position, they were certified. They couldn't meet the six-month qualification but because it's now like September, and so one month. Okay, you've gotten into uh, really the meat of our discussion today, and we'll go back and pick up some of that here a little bit later, but I want you to kind of take a step back, if you were, have us take a step back, and see if you can lay out the intricacies of the Illinois personnel code and personnel system and how it really function so that we have a better understanding of uh, the implications of some of the things that happened at the end of the Ryan administration. Well, the personnel code <coughs> is a statute. Its purpose is to have employees under the jurisdiction of the governor be chosen on fitness and merit. Under the jurisdiction of the governor, does that include Secretary of State and the other constitutional officers? No, they have their own personnel code. Okay. Uh, so we're talking anywhere from 55 to 65,000 employees. Most of them are under the personnel code, meaning they are hired, they serve a probationary period, they're certified, and they have all the protections of the code, including certain benefits health insurance, retirement, ability to bid on promotions. Then you have the statute allows the Civil Service Commission to exempt certain employees from the personnel code. And the Civil Service Commission seems to take the employee's reporting relationship to the director as the standard. For example, uh, the departments have public information officers. The head, the chief public information officer, reports directly to the director. Therefore, that person is exempt from the personnel code. You can go through head of the budget, so on. So that there, the statute exempts certain people from the personnel code. For example, wardens, deputy directors. So they serve essentially at the will of the governor. But then you also have positions that can be exempted by the Civil Service Commission. And their standard really is one of reporting. How close are you to the head of the department? The theory there being that uh, the new administration needs to be able to uh, bring in people who have a similar philosophy and a, uh, an approach to governance? Absolutely. But the problem was, and I read Civil Service Commission minutes, during my 
contractual period, I read, I think I went back two years, may even gone back to the beginning of the Ryan administration. And I saw departments presenting to the Civil Service Commission the outline of positions they wanted exempt from the personnel code, meaning that person served at the will of the governor or the director of the department. And then, after Ryan decided he was not going to run again, those very same departments were presenting new organizational plans to the Civil Service Commission and putting positions that had been exempt from the personnel code, now making them protected by the code. So we had all sorts of things going on in the year 2002 to, in a sense, freeze in people who had been exempt but now would be protected by the personnel code and therefore the new administration would not be able to appoint people to those positions. Mm -hmm. uh, who were the members of the Civil Service Commission and how do you get to be a member? Oh my goodness, that's, that's <laughs> I don't remember. It's an appointment by the governor confirmed by the Senate. Okay. And is it is it paid positions in the state or is it... Uh, yes, but it's not full-time. Okay. They meet at a certain basis. Um, the Civil Service Commission, uh, my view is their primary task is to deal with what positions are exempt or protected by the personnel code and to deal with disciplinary action so that if a person is fired, there's a hearing officer, here's the case, makes a recommendation to the Civil Service Commission and they adopt it or reject it. Is there some attempt in the appointment process to make this a bipartisan board? Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, you haven't mentioned the word Rutan. How does Rutan factor into this? Well, see, that's my basic problem. I think that if you are exempt under Rutan, meaning that the position can be filled politically, I believe you ought to serve at the will of the governor. Mm -hmm. And I believe that the Rutan exempt positions ought to be exempt from the personnel code. So you have two different standards. To be exempt under Rutan means that the job is such that politics can be taken into account when you fill the position. Personnel code, it's how close is that person to the director. So you have positions that are Rutan exempt that are protected by the personnel code. That makes no sense. Mm -hmm. I think an administration needs to put in its people to make sure that its policies are implemented. But is it, it's a, is it true to say though that if, uh, if a position is not Rutan exempt, well, let me put it this way, the personnel code, if it's not personnel exempt, it's covered by Rutan? No. You can have a position that is protected by the code that is Rutan exempt. And I have never understood that. Okay. <laughs> well, this is almost Byzantine and trying to understand how it all works. Well, I mean, to me, if, you can, <clears throat> if the position is such that it can be filled politically, that position ought to serve at the will of the governor. And if a new governor comes in, the new governor has the right to put his person in that position. Mm -hmm. But through an organizational chart, the Rutan exempt position may end up with personnel code protection because the Civil Service Commission says, hey, you're not close enough to the director of the department. You're deserving of protection. So the, they're very different standards and they just don't make sense to me. Okay, maybe this is even more confusing. What does it mean to be double exempt in the state of Illinois personnel system? That you are exempt from Rutan and exempt from the personnel code, meaning that you truly serve at the will of the governor. Okay, and how are those positions determined? By the Civil Service Commission? By a statute? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now I'm really confused. <clears throat> if the Civil Service Commission says the position is exempt from the personnel code, you have one part of the double exception. If you look at the job, and this has always been really central management services in the governor's office, if you look at the job and you say politics is a prerequisite for that position, 
then it's double exempt. It's exempt under Route 10, it's exempt under the code. Well, it sounds then that those decisions, those positions that are double exempt, those are emanating from the governor's office. That is correct. Um, after Rutan came down, uh, Governor Edgar selected a consulting firm to do two things. To create a manual to train the state employees on how to fill positions based on merit. And secondly, to determine the positions that were Rutan exempt. And those positions in like 93, 92, 93, when we settled Rutan, there were about 3,000 exempt positions. And I had a notebook that the governor's office gave me, and when they updated it, I would get a new version listing every Rutan exempt position by department and by location. And I had no problem with those positions also being exempt from the personnel code, but it didn't work out that way. Any idea why it didn't work out that way? Is I that don't think anyone's raised the question. I mean, this is one of the things, one of the recommendations I made at the end of my contract. If it was to be fixed, if it was to be realigned, how would that go about? Would it be some kind of legislation that would be required? Yes, I thought so. Revision to the personnel code. Okay. So there are lots of issues that I, that I <laughs> gave advice on that I thought should be looked at. Okay. Now, this... This isn't a question I anticipated asking, but and it's a delicate one, but uh, would it be in the interest of most chief executives, most governors coming in to keep it a little bit murky so they have more control over the hiring process of those people who are important to them? Only if they wanted to freeze in their people when they were leaving. Okay. <laughs> well, that takes us full circle, doesn't it? Yes. Um, it probably is good at this point in the discussion to talk about the end of the George Ryan administration and the atmosphere, the, the position he found himself in those last few months of his administration. What was he going through? Well, there was certainly word of indictment. And that was, you know, that had dominated the news for a long time. I mean, people were saying as soon as he's left office, mm -hmm. he's going to be facing a federal indictment. And his chief advisor was already going through the, the trial process? That's right. Okay, and that's Phelan? No, no, Phelan, uh, okay. Phelan's company pled, but he did not, John Phelan did not plead. Okay, okay, okay. Um, so that's hanging over everybody's head at the end of his administration. And, and that's why this transition team became so important, because the thrust was reform, ethics, that kind of thing and um, didn't turn out that way. Now, most people would look back at the George Ryan administration. Uh, obviously, he's in jail today uh, for the abuses of his administration, or going back to the time he was Secretary of State in many cases as well. But uh, how would you characterize the personnel abuses of the George Ryan administration in those last few months then? Well, there was the taking people out of their four-year term appointments who had like a year to go, having them take new four-year term appointments so they would be around. Now remember in the fall we didn't know who was going to be governor, but it certainly wasn't going to be Governor Ryan. So those people are now going into new four-year term appointments, so they're going to be around until almost the end of the incoming governor's administration. We had people who had been in exempt positions now going into a position under the personnel code and being able to be certified within uh, 30 days. We also had people, particularly at IDOT, who were taking demotions, um, going from like a technical manager eight down to a technical manager four, and the manager eight is exempt from Rutan, the four is protected by Rutan, and uh, keeping their salaries. Under the personnel code, if you're demoted, your salary can change after one year. But under this technical manager system, which is only at IDOT, you could be demoted and keep your salary. Supposing you're making 85000 you go to a position that should be at forty five. you keep your 85000 even though you've gone down to a 45000 position. So all these things were happening in the fall. And I got a phone call from a union rep, and he said, I've heard this rumor 
that people are going to get certified in 30 days. He said, that can't be. Well, I tracked it down and found out it was this proposed rule to JCAR to certify people within 30 days and not the usual mm -hmm. six months. So if I remember correctly, I notified both gubernatorial candidates and both took a position against that rule. But Okay. Uh, let's back up a little bit and have you explain JCAR, what its role is, what it is. Well, JCAR was the Joint Committee on Administrative Rules made up of equal numbers of Democrats and Republicans. In the legislature? Yes, they're all members of the legislature. <coughs> and they sit as a committee and they review all the rules proposed by departments. And once those rules are approved, they go into effect and become part of the Illinois Administrative Code, and that has the status of law. So here comes this administrative rule to change certification to 30 days, and J. Carr met, and if I remember, uh, one or two members did not show up for that meeting, and there were not the votes to block an emergency rule, so the rule went into effect. Um, any views? of yourself or other people in the new administration about why those people didn't show up to block? No. No. Okay. I, that remained a mystery, but you have to vote to block an emergency rule, not vote to approve it. So the onus is on the legislature to act against it? That's correct. Okay. Giving more power to whoever is proposing this, in the, this case the Ryan administration? Yes. Okay. Um, well, all of these things that you're talking about sounds like an elaborate way for George Ryan at the end of his term that's under this huge cloud of doubt and suspicion because of all of the allegations that are swirling around of protecting his people for as long as he possibly can. Absolutely. Of, of taking care of his, his people. Absolutely. And there were the three different ways. You know, the 30-day certification, the reorganization so people who are exempt from the personnel code are now protected by the code, the 30 days, the four-year term, and then this demotion thing at DOT. No, nobody else seemed to be doing quite that. Why was DOT different? Well, DOT is the only department that has this strange technical manager personnel system, which the courts have held doesn't protect anyone, that they really do all serve at the will of the head of IDOT. But IDOT internally has always handled it as though it were a personnel code. So if the courts aren't backing it, how do they have the force of law to move somebody from one position to a lower position yet still let that person draw his former pay? Who can challenge it? That's the interesting issue. Okay, if, you look at that, if you look at the technical manager series, which I did, and looked at those people who did these demotions, under that system, there is nothing that prevented that from happening. That was another recommendation that I made, that you ought to abolish the technical <coughs> manager system at IDOT and just have everybody under the personnel code, either exempt under the code or protected under the code, but don't have this other sort of crazy personnel system out at IDOT. Okay. Why don't you, you've kind of gotten there anyway, why don't you talk about the specific recommendations you made, or maybe let's back up from that the uh, process, the discovery process, if you will, of, of how all these things were working in the administration. Did you have a hard time digging all of this information out? No, a lot of it was public record. Uh, I did review transactions at IDOT. I made the recommendation that it's in terms of IDOT, I didn't like what had happened, but under the technical manager system, there was nothing illegal about going from an $80,000 position to a $40,000 position and keeping the $80,000 salary. And if you then remove those people because they were, in a sense, Ryan's <coughs> political appointments, you'd be violating Rutan because you would then be firing these people on the basis of their political affiliation. It was quite a box. It was quite a box. And it, I often <coughs> wondered when they started staying up at night, thinking up all aspects of the scheme to keep their people 
in positions. So my first recommendation was to get Rutan and the personnel code aligned. Okay. This, the next one was to abolish that technical manager system out at IDOT. Um, I then suggested there be a committee to look into pay equity because I thought historically women had been slotted into positions of a lesser pay. Um, for example, you can be an administrative assistant, one, two, or three. You can be an executive, one, two, or three. I thought they were basically doing much of the same work, but women seemed to be slotted into one category where the pay was less, men into the other where the pay was more. So I thought that that would be a real plus to have the governor look into the way salaries were set. Um, I also recommended the state was so stupid. If you went to work for the state, they were giving you an automatic 10% raise over what you'd been making in the private sector. And I said, why? I think there might be people who would want to go to the state for less than they were making in the private sector because they had such great retirement and health insurance coverage. So I suggested that there not be an automatic 10% increase uh, for people who want to work for the state. Did you find in looking at all these things that the Ryan administration did at the end of their administration that there was willful wrongdoing or just that you were philosophically opposed to some of the, the mechanisms that he was going through? Yeah, I was philosophically opposed. I thought the incoming governor <coughs> ought to have the right to have exempt positions. And you see, by taking somebody who's exempt, putting them in a position and then certifying them after 30 days, your headcount hasn't changed. And so the incoming governor would not have the number of vacant positions to fill because he's constrained by headcount. He can only have so many headcount given his appropriation. And so if, if they were suddenly made uh, protected under the personnel code in a new four-year term appointment, that limited financially the ability of the new governor to hire people. So it was twofold. It was protecting people politically and using the system to do it. But it was also because these people were still on the payroll. It had financial implications in terms of the governor's inability to hire. Mm -hmm. Would have <clears throat> then a lot of these people we're talking about were able, for example, the positions where uh, at the end of the administration they took a couple or a few days, um, they stepped out of the position for a few days, came back in, and now they're guaranteed for another four years. Those That's people right. were allowed to stay in their positions for another four years? Yes, that was cases? litigated. And they were allowed to there stay? There were some that were removed, yes. And I mean, what I, what I really meant that seriously, <clears throat> I don't believe in four-year term appointments. I think it was a crazy idea. If you're exempt from Rutan, you're exempt from Rutan, and you should serve at the will of the governor. Um, when they first conceived of the idea, I think it was to be four years matching the term of the governor. But somehow when the legislation got passed, it was 25% per year. So the incoming governor was going to be stuck with a lot of people who had been put in positions politically, but he couldn't get rid of them till the end of their four-year term, and they were staggered. Did you put all this in writing and a written report then to the new administration? Well, I did a lot of it orally, and then when I called in May, because as I told you, I had stopped working, and I called in May and asked where I should send my written report, I was told not to put anything in writing. So no written report ever went. Why would the new administration not want you to put this into writing? Well, my suspicion would be that later on somebody would get a hold of this report and say, hey, Mary Lee Leahy recommended you look at salary inequity. You know, she said, get some people, high-powered people, to look at this problem, which faces women working for the state, but you didn't do it. Or you ought to get rid of the technical manager personnel system at IDOT, but you didn't do it. And that's, that's what my theory was. Okay, but they explicitly said we don't want a report. Is that what you're saying? That is correct. Do not put anything in writing. Okay. No, and the interesting <clears throat> thing is that one of the things I was doing during January to the end of May was also advising some key people on Rutan and this double exempt so they would understand it. 
And what I have found out in one of my lawsuits recently is that at the very time I was doing that, they were creating, in a sense, a patronage tracking system in room 107 of the Stratton building. Because I've gotten a computer spreadsheet, 160,000 entries, <laughs> listing people who are making recommendations, the people being recommended, the type of job, and whether or not they got it, and if they got it, when. And there was no distinction made between Rutan protected positions and Rutan exempt positions. Now, I think I've not gotten any figures after the end of 2005. The, the spreadsheet seemed to stop before the end of 2005. And I believe that that may have been the, the beginning of when the Fed started looking into hiring practices in the Blagojevich administration. Okay. Um, <clears throat> you've talked about all of the, I guess you would call them abuses at the end of the Ryan administration. Would that be a fair term to use? Well, I believe they were abuses. <coughs> I couldn't call them illegal, <coughs> but I think there was a real use of the system to protect my people. Mm -hmm. um, and <clears throat> part of what your frustration, at least I'm feeling, is that you turned this information over to the Blagojevich's team, and yet nothing much happened about it. Did you have any other allies in the press or a better government association or groups like that who are kind of championing this cause as well? No, I, I viewed that I was to give, you know, a report to the administration on various problem areas in personnel. I alerted them to what I believed was, you know, like possible lawsuits in the next year or two in personnel matters. And it, it was really for them, I was just opening up the issue. And what I was making a recommendation, <coughs> but I had no power to implement it. And I think what has bothered me is that while I'm training people on the meaning, meaning of Rutan, this spreadsheet system is being created at the same time. Um, so how ironic, right? <laughs> and total violation, at least, of the, uh, the, the philosophy of Rutan in the first place? Because I would not have any problem with a spreadsheet for the three to 5,000 exempt positions. But when you get into people <coughs> shoveling coal in the power plant... 160,000 might be a little bit excessive? It was a pretty, pretty extensive entry system. Okay. How well did you personally know Rod Blagojevich? Not at all. I mean, I did not support him in the primary. Um, I supported Vallis. Paul Vallis. Yeah. Um, but when I heard about this 30-day certification emergency rule, I was really very angry. And I then contacted both campaigns, the Democrat and the Republican, uh, to alert them to this. And as I said before, they both took, they both opposed the emergency rule. Now, um, Mr. Bogoyevich at that time, in the fall after that emergency rule broke, had me attend a press conference with him to explain what the rule meant. And that was the first time I met him. Did you have many dealings with him after that? Saw him during the transition <coughs> team meetings. Um, was with him when he announced my appointment. I think it was the day after the inauguration. If not, it was the next day. And then had no contact whatsoever. My contact was, be, was to be with the legal counsel's office. Okay, so it was working with them and not directly with, with Blagojevich at all? No, I did not have any de direct dealings. Okay. Um, well, let's talk a little bit more about the relationship you had with people within his administration because you've kind of painted the picture that it wasn't all that pleasant for you. It was sometimes difficult to work with. Well, I think the first difficulty was <coughs> that I did not have the contract. And I, I can't explain it. It's sort of an attitude, well, you know, why does that bother you? Well, it bothered me because I knew by law I was required to have a contract. Um, and I did not think when I would give my oral, you know, suggestions like, hey, how about putting together a really blue star committee to look into pay equity? I didn't get the feeling that it was being taken very seriously. Do you even know if that information was getting up to the governor himself? I have no idea. 
I have no idea whether my appointment to go in and look at personnel issues was show or for real. Mm -hmm. And in the last few months since I've seen this spreadsheet, I'm beginning to think it was a lot more for show than for real. Mm -hmm. Did you ever make an attempt to uh, go directly to the governor himself and, and express some of your concerns and the recommendations you had to him directly? No. Okay. Didn't think that was appropriate to do? or No, because I had been told where the chain of command is. <laughs> and I mean, under Walker, Bill <clears throat> Goldberg, Walker's chief legal counsel, nobody could have been <clears throat> closer to him than he was. I mean, they, they talked maybe on an hourly basis during the workday. Uh, Bill played tennis with Dan in the early morning. Um, so my thinking is chief legal counsel is like the governor's right hand. So, you know, I was hopeful back then. That's a long time ago. Mm -hmm. And the transition process had led me to be very hopeful. And uh, I assumed that by telling the chief legal counsel or the deputy chief legal counsel these things that it was okay. What was your initial impression when you were first asked to be an advisor of Rod Blagojevich, the man and politician? Well, the transition experience had been such a good one that I was very eager to do this. Okay. But I, I just give you one example. I was at my aunt's funeral. I was in the car going from the cemetery to the luncheon and I think we had WBBM on, and came on that the governor had fired so many people. I think they were four-year terms. I didn't know about that. And, and so I thought that perhaps I should have known about <laughs> that. Uh, so anyway, I mean, that, so, you know, we're going, we're going from a real, I don't want to say high, but a very high opinion of the new administration and what it wanted to do during the transition period. And then by mid-February, you know, they're not thinking it even important enough that I have a contract. Mm -hmm. Was that the thing then that really started to turn your attitude that perhaps they weren't as sincere about all of this, or was that later? Well, I mean, I had tried. I mean, I went to Chicago for a special meeting with the chief legal counsel because my faxes and my messages weren't getting anywhere. You know, I need a contract. When am I going to get my contract? That kind of thing. Okay. So. Um, was there any uh, definite end of your relationship with the Bulgoyevich administration then? A terminus of this job? Oh, yes. I mean, it was supposed to be for three months. I was paid for three months. I stopped in mid-February. After I got my contract, I completed my work and was ready to give my final ideas that I'd already relayed orally, ready to do that in May. Mm -hmm. So yes, it ended in May. Did you actually, I know you said that they weren't interested in the written report. Had you prepared anything in writing for them? Yes. Where is that now? In my office. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's interesting. You know, I got through about three or four of the areas of recommendations and then called and then just stopped. So, but okay. uh, you know, those, some of those recommendations are, are still alive and well and still needed. So we'll see what happens next January. Would you be willing to serve on a future administration in the same capacity or offer up the suggestions oh, that course. you had before? Of course. Okay. At the end of this time period, let's May, you say? Yes, of May of 2003. 2003. Uh, what was your opinion of uh, Rod Blagojevich, the politician, then? Not bad. Um... I didn't see as much movement on some of the suggestions of the transition team, but then, you know, a lot of things needed legislation, and the legislature was not quite as friendly, I might say. Mm -hmm. Well, this, is, this has nothing to do with your official capacity, but how would you rate uh, Governor Blagojevich today? An awful lot of water under the bridge now. The administration thought that they could do things without legislation and without funding. I mean, I would have thought that impeachment grounds were available for trying to do things with programs 
that the legislature had rejected and the legislature had not funded. For example, he tried to expand a family care program. Legislature rejected the expansion. It violated the Federal Act. There were no funds for it, and he went ahead and did it anyway. And that seemed to be the attitude that we can do whatever we want to do and not be bound by certain statutes and by certain funding restrictions. And that became very troubling mm -hmm. to me as the years went on. Uh, would you say that some of the things he was trying to do were um, contrary to the Constitution? I mean, you were intimately involved in the creation of the Illinois State Constitution. I knew of no constitutional authority for a governor to put in place a program that had been rejected by the legislature and not funded by the mm -hmm. legislature. I thought he was violating separation of powers. He was invading the legislative power and, in a sense, not giving a damn about it. He wanted to do it. He thought it was a good idea to get it done. He went ahead and did it, even though the legislature had not approved it. Mm -hmm. well, we didn't ask you earlier about your personal assessment of George Ryan as a governor. Well, I thought George Ryan was a good politician. I remember when he was Speaker of the House and led the charge to defeat the Equal Rights Amendment. I remember having to go before a committee he chaired to get an appropriation for DCFS when I was part of the Walker administration. He was very angry at me, and I had nothing to do with the fact that the Senate had not released my appropriation bill. And that was the Senate's control, that he didn't know why the bill wasn't down in front of the House earlier. Um, I must say that with his political appointments, I thought he appointed people who were far more competent than the people that Boglojevich appointed. And I'm talking about exempt positions. At least the Republicans had an element of competency. And I was very concerned, not about directors or deputy directors at the Boglojevich administration, but like bureau chiefs, like head of personnel, appointing a woman head of personnel in agriculture who had absolutely no experience in personnel ever. What must that have been like for morale? Because I had taken depositions over the years of people who worked at ag and who worked in personnel, and those employees had been there 20, 25 years. And the new head of the Department of Personnel walks in with no experience, and they report to her, but they have to train her. I don't think that's good for morale. And I have never seen morale as bad as toward the end of the Bogoyevich administration. Well, <clears throat> that brings us to the opportunity of asking you to make some comparisons, because you served in the Dan Walker administration in the mid-'70s. Of course, Walker, after he was out of office for things he had done having nothing to do with his term as governor, he ended up in jail. But you've got that case, and now both Ryan in jail now and Blagojevich being impeached and waiting trial. How would you compare Walker with Blagojevich, for example? Oh, Walker believed in governing. <clears throat> I don't know that Blagojevich ever had a cabinet meeting. Um, Walker believed in management by objective, so each department had objectives that they had to meet and we gave quarterly reports to the governor's office on what we were doing. For example, my trying to remove so many kids from institutional care to foster care, from foster care to group homes, from group homes back home. I mean, we had goals. Um, I remember <coughs> Joyce Lajoff, head of public health, he had to inoculate so many children in the state of Illinois per year, per quarter. We had goals that we had to meet. I don't know that any department under Bogoyevich had to account for what they were doing. You know, I do other work. I do family law, I do wills, I do a little bit of simple probate, and I've had people come to me who work for the state. I had one woman come about a year ago and she said, you know, I'm a head of a bureau. I used to have to tell somebody what my bureau did. She said, I haven't had to report what we do in three years. And, and that, you know, I got friends, I have clients, and everyone that could retire, retired as soon as they could, or they're counting the days till they can retire. And that wasn't true 
20 years ago, 30 years ago, people felt it an honor to work for the state of Illinois. Um, the other thing is that when <coughs> the impeachment proceedings were going on in the House, I got online and got some of the documents they had used, and one of them was a letter of an attorney who had worked in the governor's office in Chicago for maybe 15 months, 18 months. And I thought the governor was just not being in Springfield, but he was hardly ever in the governor's office in Chicago, that he operated out of his home. And, you know, I just found that very unusual. So there was no presence of governing, particularly in the second mm -hmm. term. Okay. Uh, let's go back just a little bit. Um, you mentioned that uh, this, this contract that uh, was eventually signed but it had taken out the phrase legal advisor, was that correct? Legal counsel. Legal, legal counsel. consultant, I think, was the word. Okay. Did that have any implications down the road? Well, if I'm retained as a lawyer to give legal advice, then I have malpractice coverage. My malpractice coverage doesn't exist if I am just simply an advisor on personnel matters. And what are the implications of that, for again, for, from a layman's perspective? There would have been a lot of monetary implications if I'd been sued. Mm -hmm. So you would have been hanging out on your own if, in that case. And what was interesting that you bring that up is that some employees who were discharged were represented by Howard Feldman and Carl Draper and Jim Craven Sandan, and they tried to take my deposition in one of these discharge cases where Bogoyevich had discharged people. And when I went for my deposition, the attorney then representing the defendants put up every privilege they could think of, including the attorney client privilege, to prevent me from answering any questions in the deposition. Were they entirely successful? No. The defense counsel went before the federal judge, Judge Scott, and she ruled that I was not retained as an attorney, and therefore the attorney-client privilege did not exist. And so I went back and gave my deposition. Well, a little bit of, I hesitate to use this word, but a little bit of revenge or irony involved in that then? I think so. But what was really <laughs> ironic was that <clears throat> I knew everyone in the room. It was the attorney representing the defendants at that time, I believe, was from Jenner and Block, a young man by the name of Devine, mm -hmm. whose dad was the Cook County State's attorney, <laughs> Dick Devine. And Dick Devine had represented me in a DCFS lawsuit. Uh, so, you know, and I, Devine went to Knox College with my daughter, so I knew this attorney from way back in another part of my life. Uh, Carl Draper had been the attorney working in the governor's office when I filed Rutan, so he was involved in the preliminary things regarding that lawsuit. I'd known Howard forever. So it was kind of a very interesting thing when we all sat down for my deposition that I knew everyone in the room. The chief legal counsel for IDOT was Ellen Chancel Haskin. She and I had been co-counsel when she was in private practice on a couple of cases. So. It was kind of like um, memory lane going in for that <laughs> deposition the first time. Well, what have we forgotten to talk about here, Mary, Mary Lee? I think the lost opportunity. I think there hasn't been a governor in a very long time who had the opportunity to do what Bogoyevich could have done. I mean, you have a Democratic Senate, you have a Democratic House, you have a Democratic governor, and the departments were, I don't want to say screaming out, but they were aching for direction, guidance, competency. There was so much hope in January and February of 2003, and then nothing happened. And I think it was just a tremendous lost opportunity. And when you're saying lost opportunity, not just the reform of the personnel system to make it more efficient and more logical and how it was structured, but in other areas as well? Absolutely. Ethics. I mean, it was just crying out for ethics legislation. And we finally got something through. 
uh, just recently since Governor Quinn's mm -hmm. become governor. So, I mean, there were all sorts of areas. Um, there were areas where if we would have coded something different, our federal reimbursement, because my daughter worked on this, our federal reimbursement would have gone from 50% for this particular project to 75% of the cost. And when my daughter raised with the department, well, why are you coding it so you only get 50% from the feds? Well, we've always done it that way. Well, there was a real chance, and finally, after six months, they did recode it, and they began to get the 75% reimbursement from the feds. But it was little things like that where there were untold opportunities to straighten things out in the state of Illinois. Any final words for us? We've had uh, a wonderful conversation. You've helped me understand a little bit better, a lot more about the personnel system in the state. And I'm, I'm still confused about many things, but I suspect that's because it's kind of a convoluted system in that's many right. respects. And I think there ought to be a new personnel code. Okay. How would you uh, conclude then, having just said that? Oh, I'm not sure it will ever happen. <laughs> <laughs> not in my lifetime. So we'll see. Okay. Thank you very much, Mary Lee. It's been a lot of fun. Thank you. And thank you.